Well, who is doing any kind of copywriting at the moment? I know Kevin is. Bernadette. Right. Dave. And Hayden. Anyone else on the side? Maurice, no? Anyone else? Ali, you're doing some though, aren't you? I'm one of the idiots who talk about the star that's just steady, steady, steady. Typical Scotsman. That's right, yeah. yeah. You know, from that first session, uh, I, th I think it's very important that you, you do start thinking like that because that's what's made the massive difference to me. Just forget all this continuous reading and taking in information. It's just an endless, an endless pit. It takes you nowhere. It really does. You know, and if, if you can just, if something interests you, buy the book, Find the point that you need to know and carry on. And then keep your book for reference. That's all, all I do. I mean, there's a book over here. Which, and actually, this is a brilliant book for mindset thinking. This is called <coughs> 20 Ads That Shook the World. It's quite a rare book, this. It's by James B. Twitchell. It's 20 Ads That Shook the World. Now, the reason I bought this was, one, it tells you why these ads were so successful. And what happens is, when you find out, I wanted to read about this Barnum advertisement, to be honest, which was this one. That's a very, very 100-year-old advert. And I just wanted to read that, and I wanted to understand the structure behind it. And it's actually pretty evangelical in its tone for that period of time, which was right. Because as look for it, wait, see it, it is coming. The Messiah has arrived. It was that kind of tone, really. And when you read, because this talks about the campaign, how the campaign worked, why did they use certain words, why was Barnum so successful, the myths about him. And if you read some of the words in there as well, you know, the perfect exhibition. And I, I, find, I tell you why I find that very interesting, because if you look at what's happened is, before we go into this, copy, copywriting is a form of communication, as we know. Because communication goes through trans transition phases. And what happened was when uh, sales copy, as it were, started, it was kind of, we will take the message to you, and you will love the message, and you will buy the product. But ultimately, the people still went to the shop or to the stall, and they did a bit of the barter stuff, and I'll have this and I'll have that. So really, at that time, early on, the buyer or the consumer was still in control. Then when we had the modern age, the 50s, 60s, don't eat that rabbit, that's mine. I'm watching you, watching that rabbit. <laughs> you know, when, they, when they had the 50s and 60s, TV, radio, magazines and media, they started taking control. So they started feeding you everything, all the time. But what's happened over the past probably five years especially, we're in control again, the buyers are in control. Because what's happened is, People want to be in control of the media that gets fed to them. And I know somebody, I can't remember who mentioned Purple Cow, the book by Seth Godin before. Seth Godin talks about this. It's, it's what they call interruption advertising and permission advertising. So what we're, what we're trying to get into is create permission advertising. You get permission to advertise to that person rather than being interrupted every five minutes, every five seconds, by adverts, by radio, by media, by direct mail, by this. Because it's the interruption stuff that doesn't work. And it's the permission stuff that does work. Brilliant book. You, if you've got to buy that book, Purple Car by Seth Godden. And uh, the, the, I just bought another one of his books. Um, I can't remember. It's, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look after. I'll remember it for you. Anyway, so, you know, just on the book front, don't spend weeks and years and everything else reading books. My advice to you is go back to the very, very old adverts. If you look for adverts between 1900 and 1920, they're just absolutely amazing adverts. I'm going to show you some ad adverts from uh, the 20s today, which for me, they're just absolutely the greatest adverts. And you sold millions, by the way. The greatest adverts that I've ever seen. They're just so wonderful. And you'll see why. So... You are about to see the most important element in copywriting. Any piece of copy. 
<clears throat> There's a reason for this. Who's heard of Gallup polls? I'm still going today. Well, George Gallup, the guy who uh, developed that system, he used to test and measure everything, test and measure, test and measure. And another famous copywriter called David Ogilvy used to work for George Gallup. And David Ogilvy took the research ideas and brought them into copywriting. Now, you need to get David Ogilvy's two books, the only books I, I've, I've actually read from start to finish. And one of them's called um, My, uh, Confessions of an Advertising Man. It's pretty hard to get, but it's just been reprinted. Uh, what's the other one called? I forgot. My Life in Advertising, David Ogilvy. They're just such fantastic books, I can't even tell you. David Og, O G I L V Y, David Ogilvy. <coughs> Ogilvy on advertising. We'll find them for you and we'll show you them. Yeah, brilliant books, brilliant. So, the most important piece, because what Gallup and Ogilvy realized, understood, and uh, they used as one of their starting points in copy was that nearly 90% of readers, nearly 90% of readers, that's 10% less than 100, 90% of readers don't read beyond the headline. So what does that tell us about the headline? It's got to be right. And that's, that's why, I mean, Ogilvy, I know, he used to, he said he would spend about six weeks writing his headlines. He would have about, I think, I can't remember the number, about 20 headlines put down. You see, some copywriters will say, oh, yeah, I do 400 headlines and I pick the best one. Well, that's just a meaningless nothing to me. If you can write 10 really, really good headlines, then pick the one that's incredible from the 10. That's how you do it. And that's where the thinking process comes in. So let's just jump into this and see what. Now, the headline system, there's no real system because it goes back to the mindset. What is the prospect or the buyer thinking before you get there? So when they talk about, look, there is templates. I mean, in fact, Raj is going to show you some great templates. There is templates. There's some, some other stuff you can use for headlines. For me, I'm not really mad on that approach, but there's definitely a set of words and phrases that you can use the headlines to create a reaction, like announcing or how to or if you. And Raj is going to cover them in a little bit more depth later on. But for me, the system is, what is the buyer thinking about? What, what's going through the buyer's brain? That is the system. And how can I fulfill that need or solve that problem? That is the system. So forget all this. You know, this is how you do it. Because that may not be how your buyer's thinking. So, 80% of your pound. So 80 pence in every pound you spend on your marketing or your sales letters or your campaign has to be invested in the headline. It has to be. Because if, you know, you get nearly 90% who won't read beyond the headline, I've put 80% I put 80, 80 there just to drop it down, but nearly 90% don't go beyond the headline. You've got to invest that time and money in there. So, <clears throat> here's some of the rules. Solution or the product should be in the headline. Why? Why do you think? Go on, I want you to think about this. What's want some reaction. Right, so let, let's just stop here. Why should, let, why should this solution be in there? Right, so 80% not going to read beyond this, remember, so you've got to have the solution in the headline. So don't go for something mysterious, and what does that mean? Because that stops people dead in their tracks and they don't go any further. Right, and the product as well, why should the product be in the headline? Because I, t I can tell you now, every copywriting course will say to you, don't mention the product. But I'm telling you now, the product should be in the headline. Why? Ali? Like the product then with the answer to the question, this product is the answer to your question. Yeah, that's right. 
So you've got to have the product in, and the reason why is, look, if somebody phones you, because we get loads of tailor sales now, don't we, at home, loads. You say, look, well, what is it? Who are you? Oh, right, well, I'm from Everest Windows. Now, if the guy said to you, this is John from Everest Windows, we can save you 30% and we can do your windows next week. He's got to the point then, you see. He's got straight to it. Go on, at the back. Oh, oh sorry, Steve. Yeah. So you, you have to, if you... If 90% of those readers are not going beyond the headline, well, surely you have to use the headline to tell them about who you are. That's why Ogilvy would have Rolls Royce in the headline. That's why you would have Dove Soap in the headline. You've got to have it in the headline as well. So, solution of the product, reduce wrinkles. Okay. So, what's, so what's, t tell me about that. Give me some feedback on that. That's going to be in the headline, reduce wrinkles. Why? Yeah, that, that, yeah, it's a solution. Because people look in the mirror. I mean, I, I, I'm one of those lucky ones. But uh, <laughs> people look in the mirror, don't they? You know, it's like when you're getting older, and your hair's going a bit, or you've got some grey hairs, or you're getting a bit wrinkly or whatever. Then you kind of blimey. And it was quite weird. I was uh, I met a girl I'd not seen since I was 18, uh, the day before yesterday in Manchester, and she was. You know, you know when you're a kid and you have a gang, don't you? You're not going out with them or anything, but there's a gang of you all hanging around together. Well, Fiona was in our gang, Fiona Ricky, her name is. And she was a little, not dumpy, she was a little dumpy, really black curly hair. And I saw her in Manchester, because I know she'd been living in Sydney, because she works for Nike. I saw her in Manchester. I thought, is that Fiona? So I went up to her. I said, I said are you Fiona Ricky? And she went, Yeah. <laughs> She didn't have a clue who I was. And we're both mates. And why is that? Because you've changed. You look older. You know, you're three or four stone heavier than you were when you were 18. So you look completely different. But we actually think, don't we? We think we look the same as we did when we were 18. <laughs> we like to think, yeah. But the mirror tells the truth, you see. So people... That is the solution, reduce wrinkles. So let's just move on on that. But with something like that, you have to be careful of exclusion words in the headline here. Why? Because reduce wrinkles, who, who is that headline for, reduce wrinkles? That's the only part of it. Who is it for? People wrinkles. People wrinkles, right? Is it only women who want to get rid of wrinkles, or is it only men who want to get rid of wrinkles, or what is it? People. Right. So ladies... Reduce, well, it can be men as well. I'm just getting get a point here, so don't go all <laughs> feminist on me. <laughs> don't start beating me up. <laughs> so, ladies reduce wrinkles. Now, what is that done straight away? That's excluded. Right. Now, you've seen the men's beauty care market now. Has anybody seen any figures on it? Absolutely astronomical. And it's rising fast. So, straight away, if you just use reduce wrinkles, you're actually cutting out a massive part of the market in a fell swoop. So you're losing sales. But if you just use that instead of that, so you've got to be careful of exclusion words and headlines as well. Is it a generic? Can it cover male and female? Is it covering these drivers and those drivers? Or is it just purely for just that one? This is where you have to think about your headlines. Alan, we, can I just say one Steve, thing on yeah. that? One thing as a general marketing <coughs> point, if any of you are doing your own products on that, you're always better off, even if the product is better for everyone, just from the stand of copywriting, you're better off making that into two separate products for each niche, always, yeah? Because you're always, if, if, if you went looking, if the ladies in this room went looking for a wrinkle cream and they saw one that says <coughs> reduce wrinkles or they saw one that says ladies reduce wrinkles, which one are you going to buy? Ladies. Right, and if the men went looking for it and they saw one that said men, now it could be the exact same product. It just says men and it says ladies, yeah? So think of it like that, like it can be a generic product, no one's saying it can't, but by yeah. breaking it down into a niche, you're more, you're targeting that market better. Yeah. And you can probably even break it down even more, even if you said ladies over 50. Yeah, so that's then right. you qualify yeah. in different groups, and then you can break it down, break it down even more, and then target the copy to each individual yeah, sector. It easier yeah. To write copy. The copy will be better because if you're targeting the older women, you can use bullet points and you can use motivational points that are specially designed for older women. Yeah, they're not going to have the same motivation necessarily that young women are going to have. 
it's just not it's not the way it works yeah. so in other words you have to think about the mind of your target so who, who are you aiming at are you just doing for women over 50 is it just women at 35 or is it men and women or whatever and the, the self-interest again how anyone over now that's what was, what Steve's saying we're starting to target now how anyone over 35 now you've excluded but you've niched the product now you're starting to niche it down which narrows it right down and it gives you more focus on the copy then because people at 35 don't think the same as somebody at 25 so again the copy could be more tailored more narrowed down there now, you could even break, break that down into geography as well depending if you're marketing locally or globally you can say how anyone in Hampstead over 35 or how any woman living in Hampstead over 35 can reduce wrinkles yeah, that's right. easily. Yeah. So, so th this, this is where you have to... You, you can see this, what's going on here, right? This is why you need to spend a couple of weeks thinking about your headlines. Because I can tell you right now, what most people do is they spend forever on the copy, then they throw a headline in. But we now know that nearly 90% of people don't read really beyond the headline. And we've put 80% on there as... You know, it's kind of a safe number. So do, go on, Steve. And it also, it also just, it, it, it makes, <coughs> it adds strength to what you said before about this, this is a whole marketing exercise, yeah? The copy's one part. Mm -hmm. If you haven't done the earlier steps right, which is find what market you're targeting, you're going to have a harder time writing the copy when you get to it. Yeah. If you're doing what Alan's saying and you're finding out exactly what you want to do when you get to the copy, it's, it's, it's much easier. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And also put news into the headline. Why do you put news into the headline? Current. current, yeah, yeah. Any other reason? Credibility. Credibility, okay. Interest. Interest. Dave. Yeah, I was just saying. Well, if, if it's in the news, it brings people's minds, so you're you're tapping into the psyche of the moment anyway. So. Yeah, and that, that was that was the exact point I was thinking, Dave. With with, it, with news, you can try and tie certain things in. You, you know, I mean, what what the beauty creams do now? They tie everything in to global change, don't they? And they're all, it's very clever how they do it. It's all marketing. But they're using the news, so you can use news as in new, or you can use news as in what's current, what's happening. Because, you know, what's happening 20 years ago wouldn't probably work in an advert now if it was based on news. So build news into it because it creates interest. Reduce buyers. Uh, sorry, reduce buyers want new. Uh, just use the word free. I'm just going to go through these because I want to go into some other stuff. We're going to finish it one. Who can resist free if something says free? You read it because free is a grabber. Everybody wants everything for free. The problem with free is, the problem with, with free is it doesn't pre-qualify a buyer. It doesn't pre-qualify buyers. And the problem is, you, you may end up with a, a huge database of, say, 10,000 leads, but are they pre-qualified to buy from you? No. Or are you quite happy to go through an exercise where you're willing to give away stuff for free forever? So you need to pre-qualify people. Th this is why you've seen so many websites now with the opt-in box. Because it just pre-qualifies. And you know, some people will say to you, well, hang on. For every hundred people who come to my web page, there's only five people going through on the box. So I'm missing 95 email addresses. Well, you're not missing 95 email addresses. You're missing 95 people they're just not interested. So not actually missing them, you don't want them anyway. So that is why the squeeze page is important. The squeeze page is a name and email box. That's why it's important to have them. But if you're somebody like um, Armand Morin, who tells me that he gets between 30 and 40% through his name squeeze box, which is absolutely monstrous. It's a massive number. I get about 24%. <coughs> 20, and 24% is brilliant. Brilliant. But Dave, what just, do you want to say that your website, Dave? Um, it's uh, stagechart.com, which is a, a website to... Dave, we're going to give you the mic, sorry. Sorry, it's uh, stagechart.com and it's a website to uh, network and link theatre people. Because theatre is my industry, the industry I've worked in, so it's what I know. So I'm, you know, I'm partly doing an internet business on, on what I know and using all that experience. But it's basically to get, it's a cross between, I suppose... Uh, monster jobs and uh, friends, re friends reunited. It's to get people communicating with each other and helping them find work. Yeah, and the reason it's 24% is would any of us not go to his website? Because it's a very niche website. So because it's niche, he's getting a high number. 
And that's what Steve was saying before about breaking products down as well into subcategories. It, it creates more sales, it definitely does. <coughs> There's a, cliches are a little bit controversial in copywriting. I personally couldn't care less as long as it works. And cliches do work. Why do they work? Because cliches are how people think. That's how you think in cliches. I mean, as, as a, an English person, we only use between five and 600 words. That's what we use. I mean, well, what's this then? What's this here? But we only use between five and 600 words. So cliches are in here. And when you say cliches in your copy, they can relate to it. I'm sorry, I can't click my fingers. <laughs> now, my daughter, Lily, she's always saying, Dad, this is how you do it. She clicks the fingers, she's seven. And when she sees this, go, no, she sees this now. Watch this, Lily. <laughs> how do you do that, Dad? And he's saying, embrace cliches because they work. Emotional words, love. Friend, proud, baby, etc. Emotional words that help people to come into the copy and to feel like you, you're their friend, you're there for them. Just pull them in. We're going to go more into this again. We're going to go a lot more into these. Brand name and the headlines. What we were saying before about the product. People want to know, who is it? What, what do you want? Tell me what do you want. Don't waste my time. Don't waste my time. I'm online for two minutes at work in the office and I want to know what you're selling. Tell me. So, you know, you've got a big percent who's not going to read beyond the headline. And if they're not going to read beyond the headline, stick the product in the headline. It's important. The promise. What are you promising them? You know, these guys are a complete nightmare when they phone you up. And you know, you know those losers that phone you up and say, Hey, Mr. Smith, congratulations, you've won a weekend. And you think, oh. They don't tell you anything, do they? No. That's not a big promise to me because I don't believe them. So if they said to me, just be truthful, listen, are you interested in buying a timeshare or whatever it is? Well, you're going to respond then. So they don't tell you anything. And that is actually their headline. That is their headline there, verbally. But they, they blow it straight away. Give the promise in the headline. Somebody want to speak? No. And avoid negatives. Now, actually, in certain cases, negatives do work in headlines. They do work, and they work well. Um, but the problem is with a negative is, out of the ten words, if you have one negative, people tend to pick up on the negative. So the negative can override the other nine words. So you have to be careful with a the negative. They do work really well, but I personally stay away from them because they don't have a great track record. And only in certain situations they will work really well. So be very, very careful with a negative in a headline. Alan, one, one little thing. You, yep. you, one, I remember once I sent over a letter to you that I'd done on something, and your solution for it was because the subheadline was actually quite good, even though it was a negative. And so all you, all you suggested doing was tagging in a positive on the end of it, and it right. changed the whole feel of it. Yeah? So if you want to hit the negative, hit it, but then put just behind it a positive. That, that straight away flips their perspective back to the positive. Mm -hmm. So you've hit them and they've gone, oh yeah, I'll miss out on that. Mm. But you straight away turn them back to not if you buy this product. Yeah, so you, yeah, well, this particular one was a real estate thing and, and I was giving a list of all the reasons why they wouldn't yeah, want to subdivide themselves. This guy subdivided houses. He could do it all for them. Now, if you know anything about subdividing, there's a lot of work involved with councils and stuff. This guy would take care of everything for people. And I, actually, I was actually going into in this section why they wouldn't want to subdivide themselves because you're going to have to go through all this stuff. And all I did was tag on the end, except, you know, I can't remember what it was, yeah. except if you use me or whatever, something like that. Yeah. But it straight away changed the whole vibe. And then that was an easy way of, of fixing it, which yeah, is your yeah. suggestion. So, yeah, it's a good point. And hooks to headlines. Hooks to headlines is something that has nothing to do with the product. You, you know watch adverts on TV now? And you've watched them ten times, and you've still got no idea what they're on about. But they're quite entertaining. Well, that, that is what some old copywriters call hucksterism. And really, it means that the, the graphic or the headline or whatever has absolutely zero relation to the rest of the copy, the product or anything. 
I, I can't think of any, can anybody think of anything off the top of the head where they show something on TV or advertise, but it's got nothing to do with the product? Can't think of any now. Give them any, Roger? Just. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Zoos. <laughs> but, you see, but you see, and what this does is it has a cognitive effect and it literally stops people in their tracks. Because <clears throat> the second they have to think, what does that headline mean? They move on. They'll just move on then. So if they have to start thinking about the headline, you've lost them. You've lost your sale straight off. So let's write a couple of headlines here, shall we? <clears throat> let's, let's do this. Now, these are, these are actual headlines from actual adverts. This is a headline. So, here's the advert. New Sony AV format MP3. You know what? I mean, would you keep reading that? No. You know, if you really want to be bored to death, please keep reading this junk. I mean, <laughs> it just it doesn't really mean anything, does it? It doesn't really mean anything. And would that make you read the rest of it? For me... No, it wouldn't. So let's see if we can put together another headline on this one. Right, and what, what I want us all to do is I wanted to break these, this headline down and see why it's different, because it's actually the same product. Right, new Sony, blah, 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 blah. So we've got in here, what kind of word is this? Yeah, it's, it's actually a couple of words, futuristic, it's kind of emotional revolution. Of the revolution! You know, it's a bit like, well, let's do it. So, so we've got revolutionary new kind of Sony DVD recorded. Invented. It's just invented. It's brand new. Half the press. So we've got this. Revolutionary. We've got new. We've got the product. We've got what it does. We've got it's just invented. And guaranteed to record anything you want. And here's the killer. Here's the killer on this one. I mean, who has ever bought a DVD that does that? <laughs> ever. <laughs> and in our house, we shout, when you get a new DVD, shout, Christian Elliot, show me how to do it, the kids. Because when you're older, you can't do that stuff, can you? It's just ridiculous. So look at the headline. Lev revolutionary. New. Product. Guaranteed, which means buy this and you no risk. Simply press one button and the copy. When I first tried, look, look, see how the copy's a bit conversational. When I first tried the brand new, I couldn't believe how easy it was to use. Because you're just saying it to James. James, when I tried that, I couldn't believe how easy it was to use, mate. Honestly, no joke. That's, you write that down, that's what you do. So, there's the first one. You see the difference? Dull, boring, grey garbage. <coughs> and this here, in the right situation, will sell products. Right, somebody tell me what this one is about, because I haven't got a clue. It's an actual headline. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it does. It's okay. Just let's remember 80 to 90 percent won't go beyond the headline. And we, there's how many, I don't know, what's in this room? 25? And we're trying to work out what this headline says. Go on, Janine. Um, I was just saying that it's trying to, um, not very well, it's trying to point out that it's not harmful to the stomach because um, painkillers such as Nurofen, which yeah. is an ibuprofen. Um, actually damages your stomach lining and causes gastro and cardio side effects and right. damages your heart and things like that. So that's trying to say it's natural, so it's not harmful to your body and all that kind of stuff. But right, so who who's switched off halfway through that? <laughs> yeah, you, you, see, you see what I mean? This is a headline, a headline. <clears throat> At last, 
a remarkable scientific breakthrough that has proven to eliminate 93% of back pain new back attack. I've had back pain now for 18 years. When I was asked to try a new back attack, I really didn't think it would work. Most things I try never do after just one blah, blah, blah. So look at the headline again. If you've got a bad back, because that was actually for bad backs. That's what it was for. If you've got a bad back, you know how hard it is to get painkillers to relieve yourself of a bad back. So he's saying, at last, at last, emotional pulling, at last, it's finally here. A remarkable scientific. You know what that means? It has been tested, it has been proven. We've had the men in the white coats, and they have done the business on it. And this stuff works. Scientific. This is how people's minds think when they read this stuff. This is how it thinks. And it's a breakthrough. So it's new. It's hot off the press. You've probably never tried it. It is breakthrough, this stuff. And look how much back pain. All right, you maybe have 7% of your back pain left. But 93% of the back pain that keeps you awake every single night, stops you playing football, going swimming, will be gone. And it's called new back attack. So again, you can see what's happening with the headline. You see the difference again? At last, remarkable scientific breakthrough. If only 80 to 90% are reading the headline, they've got it all in there, they've got the promise, 93, it's new, it's blah, 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 blah. You see everything that's built into the headline. And again, the conversational copy underneath. Oh, I've done it back to front on this one. So the first one there was for the new Beetle. This was an actual ad. The new Beetle has everything a new car should have. ABS, CD player, etc. Leather optional, colour choice of six colours. Right. That's an actual advert. I can't ask what it's for now because I've brought the other one. And it says, I'm in love! Ah! <laughs> I'm in love! The brand new Beetle, Turbo, Turbo Beetle, love it! has curves to die for because they're so round and delicious, drives like a dream, turns heads. What are you shaking your head for? It does. <laughs> 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 it's definitely selling sex. <laughs> no, it's selling Beatles. Hey, you drive a Beetle? Yeah. We're in the gang. <laughs> so warning, strictly for bug fanatics. Why does it say that? Because you either love or you hate a Beetle. It's like minis, you either love or hate minis. Certain cars, you love them or you hate them. So it's very targeted. I'll never drive anything else again. When I was offered the test drive, I thought, okay, let's try it. Wow! The new book blew me away. Not only does it look and feel cool, blah, blah, blah. But you see, you can imagine, you can you imagine, right, if you went to Volkswagen or a niche garage and said, listen, I am going to write for nothing, I'm going to do this for nothing, a lot of adverts to set, so you sell. Because I did this for a guy, I've sold this before, some of you may not have heard it. He sold 18 Audi TT imports in a month, which was just over a million pounds. It was just. So, this, if you, if you could go to the garage and say, listen, if you let me control your advertising, we'll do it for free, we'll do some test runs, I'll even pay for the first advert. Because you had to pay to advertise your own services in the paper. Because they're not going to take a risk on you, are they? Because they, they don't know you. I said, I'll tell you what, if I can sell you, if I can increase your Beetle sales only or Golf GTI sales only for that period, this is what I want of you. I want a retainer every month of £1,000, plus I want a car thrown in. I want a new Beetle Turbo. I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you about a guy tomorrow in America. And this guy is now the specialist for selling BMWs. And you know how he cracked the market? In Los Angeles, he went into the garage and he said, listen, if I sell blah, 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 can I have a brand new 740i off you, BMW? So they did the deal. It's a bit of a long story. I'll, fi I'll find his website and you can have a look at his website. And what he did is he got all these gangs together, all the team, and he said, sales through the roof. And they said, you can have your 740, no problem. Just keep working for us. And this guy just works for BMW garages in America now. And all he does is their, corp, uh, their company advertising for BMWs. Just incredible, this guy. Unbelievable. 
But he's, he's, what he's done is he's took this, niched it right down. And again, look at the headlines. You've got the emotional appeal, the brand new Beetle. Hang on, is it working? Yeah, the product, the dream turns out. And it's just for bug fanatics only, nobody else. Right, what's this one for? <coughs> yeah, what's it for? Okay. So, let's have a flick through this. Fresh start, one hour, stop smoking. How can it take just one hour? Well, it's not a bad question. Forever, no matter, blah, 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 blah. So, again, very targeted. Stop smoking now. Stop smoking now. You have a testimonial type thing here. After 29 years, I no longer smoke. Three no's. Remember that from before? So, again, you see it was appealing to... Certain individual, very talented. Kevin, please, Mike, Steve, to Kevin. We'll go to Pat in a minute. Could I just ask, how would you prove that? Because you, you've done that as a testimonial. So, you know, you obviously need to prove yeah. that statement that somebody's <coughs> actually saying that. We don't have to prove it at this point because you need them to... That, that can be a, a curiosity headline as well. Right. Which will pull them into the next bit. And then you can do it a bit like... I, you know, you can start off saying something like, um, I would never have believed it. After smoking for 29 years, I finally stopped after one 20-minute session. Here's what happened. And then you can still give the name and details at the end if you want. You know, this is uh, John Smith from Brighton or wherever. So you can do it that way. But um, with this kind of advert, you would have to have some proof in the advert, definitely. Definitely. Because, you know, with no smoking products, there's a lot around it now. Uh, Pat, please. <coughs> You've got stop smoking now. Could you use uh, stop smoking in one hour, say? Yeah, you, you, could, you could do, yeah. You could. There's, no, there's no reason why you couldn't. Like yeah. uh, but you say, you s look, you've just got to, th this is where we're jumping back a bit. You've got to think about the target. What exactly would they want? I mean, does a smoker, if you said to a smoker, I mean, this is where the time element comes in. Is 60 minutes the same length of time as an hour? But, well, we know it is. But in their mind, is it? What, what, what do you think is the shorter time? 60 minutes or one hour? 60 minutes. Right. So what's the shorter time? One day or 24 hours? 24 hours. Right. So why is that? Deception. Just deception, yeah. Because, because you've got a minute on the end. A minute is shorter than one hour. Well, could you put something like, uh, stop smoking <laughs> now in only one session? Yeah, you, you, could, you could do, yeah. You, you could do anything like that, really. Yeah, you could do, but with this kind of thing, because there's so much of it around, I mean, th that there is an actual headline, remember? So there's not a lot of really good stuff around on this kind of thing. But with, it, with this, this uh, was a hypnotherapy thing, I think, as well. With hypnotherapy, because you're involved in that part. Yeah, right? well, this is the whole point. I did a, a, a seminar about five years ago. It was specifically for hypnotherapy to stop people smoking. That was the aim, nothing else, just yeah. to stop people smoking. And they actually supplied us with various types of ads as well. Obviously, I brought some with me, actually, but right. I didn't. And it, that was the main headline, stop smoking in one hour. Yeah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. But they were the people who had already done it, so they had testimonials. Yeah. And there was pictures of the people that did the stop smoking. Yeah. And their own testimonials in their ads. Right. And stuff. I wonder what would work, work easier, though. Stop smoking, have the mic, mic stay. Stop smoking in one hour or... Um, a pain-free and quick way to stop smoking fast, something like that. Because I wonder if people would believe. Can you do it in an hour? What are the 12, just quickly, what are the 12 months? From a, that's good because it doesn't actually mention exactly what it is, but if you mention stop smoking in one hour with hypnosis, people get a bit... That's right. You know, well, if they say stop smoking with hypnosis, because people in this country, not so much in America, because everybody's got a therapist in America for yeah. something or other, but in this country, <laughs> when you mention hypnosis, a lot of people get a bit scared. Yeah, oh, yeah. hypnosis. I've just done some work with a guy on, for his uh, website. Uh, for, sorry, for his business, and that's hypnosis-based. Mm. And I, I, I recommended he remove the word hypnosis. Yeah, yeah. So he has actually removed it. And the vouchers and the adverts are doing have increased his response. And I think it's because we removed that word. Yeah. 
So what he's doing for his lead generation, he offers a 20-minute free consultation. So the point is, get them through the door, do the consultation, then do the follow-up service. Bernadette, please. Well, you can hypnotise them once they're through the door to stay longer, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit naughty. I, I just wanted to say about stop smoking now. Um, I, the reason I think that's effective is because it's also got a, like a double effect. Because on one level it's command, stop smoking now. Yeah. And on the <coughs> other level it's like, you know, you can stop smoking now. Yeah. So yeah. that for me is why I'd, I'd go with that rather than in one hour. Yeah. Right. Good. All right. There's another hand too, was it? It was Ali. So, Maria? It was the same. The same. Ali, please. Uh, so, yeah, I was just thinking about um, this kind of market. You want, you want the customer to take action. You want to eliminate procrastination yeah. because it's one of the most, it's one of the most easy to forget things to do. You know, you want to stop smoking, but, you know, you never get around to it. You yeah. know, it's always, there's always something, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. As you right. say, stop smoking now. Yeah. You know, it, it gives them that action and, and with making it easy, taking away the, you know, no pain, no withdrawal symptoms. You're giving them that. You, you're giving them no reason not yeah. to take action. Yeah. And what you have to remember with this headline as well, just but we've got that which we've just discussed, uh, and smokers can relate to this because they've been smoking for 29 years, and most smokers will have tried to stop smoking at some point. So you've got that after 29 years. I no longer smoke. To smoke but look at this. You've got no pain, which is what they want. Maybe, you know, I'll stop smoking, but I don't want to go through the withdrawal process. Oops, hang on. Uh, there's no withdrawal symptoms and no more breathlessness. So you're taking the pain from them as well. So there's a big, Steve? The, the only thing I was going to say was that the other thing you've got to look at, and this <coughs> is, this is the, the reason that mindset's important. If you look at their mindset, what is one hour to one person compared to another person? When you look at that stop smoking now, to one person here, that might be a day. To another person, it might be three days. And again, it, it depends on the market. This, this is why the mindset and the research is so important. You've got to look at the market. You've got to look at what they'd be thinking. Leaving now there is, is actually pretty cunning, I think, because it lets them decide what they think now is. You know, you're not going over the edge and promising something that you might not be able to deliver for a lot of people. Yeah, and that comes from understanding the market. And I mean, I, you know, I don't know that market super well, but I know it well enough because I have looked at stuff online for it. Yeah, so. and you, you can use a twist on it as well, you know, because you can, and this is where words make a difference. You can say, can you stop smoking? But you could say, will you stop smoking? Now, which is the most effective word? But why? Right. So, yeah. So, can you stop smoking? Yeah. Mike's there. Yeah. And then it's, uh, it's, if it's, as I say, we, that's what we used to do. We, we got the original artists to use, but you had to try and play about with them and change yeah. them around. Yeah. So I would, you can stop smoking now, to me, would be a good headline. Yeah. Because if they're reading it, it's them, it's aimed at them. Yeah. If a person's reading it, oh, that's me. Okay. I must try something about that. Yeah. And just remember on these words, like, you know, can you, would you, will you, because using those certain words at the right and the wrong time can make a difference. Because can you? Yeah, I can. That's no commitment, is it? Will you? Yeah, will you? Would you? Oh, might do. Yeah. So you see how one word can make a difference in copy as well. So wh when you start doing your headline, you need to think about the... Ind see, what I do with the headline, I'd write the headline. And actually, these headlines have been quite quick to put together, these ones. But... When I do a headline, I, I think about the words as well. You know, you should, well, should I use can or should I use words? Or should I use this or should I use that? Or You've got to think like that with the headline because you've got to jump back again to the start and go to the mindset of the individual. What's it going to take to make them react? Click, James. Click. What's it going to make to get them? <laughs> You're hopeless. Right, so, so your headlines must be the red flag of the advert. So it's, I'm here, here, have a look over it, here. <laughs> that's, what, that's what your headline is. Just Speak. one really important point I just want to say before we leave that is the one thing you've got to remember is test it. 
<coughs> you don't you don't have to guess which one of those words it'll be. No. If you've got three words that you don't know what it'll be, do all three. Do the same headline with those, just those words changed and test it. In this day and age, it's, there's not very many situations where you can't test that stuff before you have to send it out bulk. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, so just remember that for everything we're talking about. You can always test. So let's jump into a quick standard test. On, uh, on your website, you can use something like um, uh, Total Business Cart, which is, sorry, one shopping cart, which gives you ad tracker, which means you can test one page against another page. Uh, if you need to know more about that, you'll have to ask me later. But you can test a dozen pages at the same time if you want to see which headline pools are best. Uh, with a direct mail, say you were sending up to 10,000, but what you would do is you could do a tiny test of 100. So you would get 400, and 100 number one would have that headline, 100 number two would have that headline, 100 number three would have that headline, and whichever grabs the greatest response, you then send your 10,000 out with the greatest responding headline. So the tests are very, very simple to do. Don't do what some people do, Janine. Don't do what some people do, Ginny. Don't do what some people do, Ginny, you naughty girl. Send 15,000 out and just hope it works. Because it was a bit of a disaster, wasn't it, really? So, you know, you've got a test in track. By the way, it wasn't Janine's fault that that happened. I can just, just say that now, Janine. But you, you've got to test these things because testing is easy. The only problem with testing is because we're in a rush and we want it to work, it takes a bit of time. That's the only thing. But it's worth spending the time rather than lose all the cash. So you need to spend that little bit of time. So the headlines must have the self-interest in news. We went through with that. The emotional appeal, big promise. The brand, the curiosity. And is this right? These are some of the greatest adverts I have ever seen. Absolutely no question. And these are from the 1920s. But just look. Just look. You, you need to print these off right. Go to charlesatlas.com, find these ads, and um, go through them. So look at this big promise. Let me prove to you, seven days, in seven days I can make you a new man. I mean, that is a big promise, right? And you've always got him, look at his underpants in leopard skin. <laughs> but when, when you read that copy, it is just inch perfect. Because it's full of emotional appeal, it's full of this, it's full of that, and it's, oh, it's just brilliant. Classic, classic adverts. And, and actually, you could run those ads today, easy. You know, somebody like Steve and his underpants look pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, look at this. Hey, that's pretty good. That's a good, I tell you, that's a killer. 15 minutes a day. Give me, and I'll prove I can make you a new man. <laughs> yeah, but there wasn't, there wasn't any camp men in the 20s, was there? Yeah, but the Yeah. And it's actually a good headline. I just used that with um, a guy called Marcus de Maria on one of his websites. It pulled really well. And the headline was involved in time. I can't remember what it said. Uh, it said something like, give me 154 minutes of your time. And then it went into the rest of the headline. But th that is just a really classic ad. You see what it has at the bottom there? The call to action. Call to action. Yeah, coupons, yeah. I mean, maybe you would have a website now. People like to go on the web straight away. So your website has to have the action response mechanism on there as well. Just absolutely fantastic adverts. And again, would you mail this coupon to get a body like mine? Blind I would. <laughs> I mean, I've already got the, yeah, yeah. I've got the underpants, just not the body. So just let me prove to you in seven days, I can make you a new man. But <laughs> you know, who, who said that? I don't know, who is that? Bernadette, right, okay, we've got you marked. <laughs> but, you know, the, the classic ads. Now, I, I know where, uh, I think it was Val asked me, do I need to be able to write copy? The truth is, you don't need to be able to write copy. Would you mail this coupon to get a house like this? And you've got a different picture there. Would you mail this coupon to get a car like this? 
You know, you just take those classics and you change the product. That's all you do. Ali, do you have a question? Um, what's, what's your thoughts? So what's your thoughts on using a word like gamble? Because... Um, I, I wouldn't use it now. Yeah. No, no I wouldn't. But just remember, these are from the 20s. And we're in a different society now. Uh, I, d I don't actually know if you get away with that advert full stop these days. But, it's, it's, you know, look, but what we're looking at is that we're talking about copywriting. <laughs> talking about copywriting and copying something that's proven. And these adverts have sold millions and millions of pounds, of dollars, of courses. So what you do is you take those formats. I mean, that is just a fantastic advert. It's just brilliant. 15 minutes a day. It's just a brilliant ad. Give me 15 minutes a day and I'll show you how you can become a six-figure copywriter over the next 12 months. 15 minutes a day. Give me 15 minutes a day and I'll prove to you you can stop smoking by the end of this week. You know, you, you don't have to be able to write this stuff. Don't, I don't want to leave these two days and try and reinvent the wheel because you're just going to become one of those people who get bogged down in reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. Steve? The, 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 yeah, on what you're saying about not knowing, there's, there's a lot of <laughs> psychology behind that, and you don't have to know how it works. You just need to know it does work. It does work, yeah. Yeah, that's all yeah. that's important here. And that's why having swipe files, you know, where lo you've got lots of ads that you can bank off, is important. And there's no reason you can't learn, because, I mean, I love learning about how that psychology works. And specifically, that piece of psychology, you're asking them before anything else to qualify themselves to you. Yeah. yeah. You know, so your promise is not what is not what is coming through immediately. You know, that that's just a piece of the psychology. So, so you get an example of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. If you have 15 minutes, yeah. qualifies them. Yeah. And there's there's a testimonial advert from them as well. <laughs> we can get Peter Wonder to translate that. Come on. I've got the one now. <laughs> But, the, you know, the bottom line is the great ads, they're really good. Look at this one. I'll prove in seven days I can make, you know, do you, do you remember those ads years ago, kicking sand in your face? <laughs> Classic. And they still work, I tell you now. Especially the young lads now, or the young girls as well, they're just totally obsessed, aren't they, by the way they look these days. You know, so, great, great adverts. But listen to this. You can, you can go away from here and create a brand new business yourself, specializing in muscle building adverts. Do you have to write muscle building adverts? No. Can you use these? Yes. Modernize them, copy them, and you start working for just within that industry. Dead easy. Dead easy. Again, he's got a lead generation there. I'll send you free my 48 page. Just find those adverts online. Just go for our, um, Charles Atlas Classics or Charles Atlas advertising, the, the fabulous adverts. So let's just move away from the headline. I don't want to spend much time on this because I think every situation for any piece of copy is totally different. People talk about how long should a sales letter be, how long should an advert be, how to do my classified. But as far as I'm concerned, I, I get kind of a little bit sick of this pigeonholing of copywriting. I think it's completely irrelevant. I, I honestly do. Because what we're talking about is passing over a message. Just passing over a message. Is it a sales letter? I don't care what it is. As long as it sells a product and gets the message across. So are we going for a magazine ad? Are we going for a newspaper ad? Are we going for a sales letter, postcard, whatever? It's all about the message. So we've got the headline. The body copy formula that I use. First of all, this might sound a bit weird, but what I do is I get to know the individual first uh, who's selling the product. For instance, I did some work for a guy in Texas, and he was, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, James, because you're an American. Is it an arborist? An abor they deal with trees. Arboriculturist. Yeah. Arboriculturist. But this guy specialized in trees. And basically, in, in the States, the, a tree has to be licensed and has to be checked and insured every year because if it falls over and kills somebody, you're stuffed. So you've got trees on your private land, this is what you have to do. So I spoke to this guy and I could not understand a word he was saying to me. And he couldn't understand the words I was saying to him. But what I tried to do was I tried to get into his character. So when I'm actually writing the copy, I'm talking like a Texan in my mind. 
because I'm trying to develop the personality and the character for his business. So you have to get into character first, or is it the character of the product? You know, how does this product work? Is it a bit funky? Is it a bit cool? Is it a bit scientific? Is it a bit in-depth and needs a lot of thought? You've got to get into the character and be enthusiastic. It's very hard to be enthusiastic over a brand new iron. I admit that. But there's different ways of doing it, and I'll show you a sec in a sec how to do that. You can be enthusiastic over anything. You know, there's no such thing as boring copy, boring products. It's just boring. Sorry, no such thing as boring products. It's just boring writing. So you've got to be a little bit enthusiastic when you're writing this stuff, stuff down. Be truthful. Don't make, you know the problem you have with clients? When clients approach you, they always try and make a promise which, one, they're not going to be able to fulfill, or two, they're not even doing it anyway. And you can imagine the effect when people buy the product, and it's majorly disappointing. So it's all right saying something, and then over-delivering on it, but if, you, if you're saying something, it's just not quite true. You know, and you get it home, and it's just, that wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. Didn't quite do it. Avoid generalities. Use this, and you will look slimmer. Use this drink, and you will lose at least seven pounds in seven days. So you see the first one, you see the second one is specific. Be fascinating. You know the story about the guy at the beginning who I was at school with, Mark Robinson? You know, I'm, tr I'm trying to tell you the little story about the guy, and you, hopefully you're listening. And, uh, you know, you're going on in the story about in Greece, how the sea was clear. So try and make the story fascinating. You know, the first time I bought my first Beetle, uh, I went to Crew. And when I went to Crew, this old couple, in fact, the, tr the truth is right. I wanted a Beetle for a while because I used to have minis. And we used to, well, say we, me and my wife, used to kind of restore minis, old minis. So I thought, right, I want a Beetle this time because I look a bit retro and a bit different. So I wanted an old Beetle, a specific one. It had to be a 1303 or 3S Super Beetle because it's just slightly different than the Ryman screen, you see. And it had the vents at the back and a 1600 engine and a 12-volt electrical system. <laughs> so I was a bit specific and I couldn't find the right Beetle. So I saw in the Auto Trader, because I, I used to watch them for sale. It was up for sale for a few weeks. I would go and see it, because I knew I could knock them down in price then. So I saw this one, and it was, I think it was about £1,400. And it was orange, which was all I wanted. So I went up, and when I got there, it was an old couple down a little back street by a canal and crew. They had a little old cottage. And uh, he'd stopped driving a year ago because he was failing eyesight. So he took me out, <coughs> and he said, it's in here, son, come on, come. So I went into this garage. Now, bear in mind, some of these beetles were complete wrecks. And he opened this garage door, and I helped him to push it up. And inside the garage was lots of blankets covering the shape of a beetle, a curvy beetle. No, it's a car I'm telling you. So I pulled the blankets off, and it was like, oh, my goodness, I have to have this car. It's brilliant. And that's what I was thinking. But I said to him, it's not quite what I want, but how much would you take for it? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I got the car and I drove home and uh, the rest is history. Now I've just told you a story about the Beetle, right? And I told you where the guy lived, how old he was, how he lived by the canal in the old cottage. And we opened the garage door and it was covered in blankets. So what you're seeing in your mind is this little old guy. And you're seeing the story. Was there, can anybody see the story live in the mind as it was going on? Well, this is what your copy has to do. It has to be fascinating. You have to pull them in. People want to hear stories, don't they? Wasn't it Jesus that sat on the hillside, spoke to 5,000 people? Well, actually, 5,000 men. And there was women and children, so maybe 10,000. But why did they listen? Because he told them stories that fascinated them. And they could relate to the fishermen. They could relate to the man in the field reaping the harvest. They knew about the parables. They knew all that stuff. So whatever you're selling, can your audience relate to these little stories? Be fascinating. Imagine if you were writing for Beetle. I mean, I would absolutely love to write for Volkswagen. Uh, honestly, I would. 
Golf GTIs and Beatles, I'd love it. And minis, is, I'd love to write for minis, because you make it really, real good story. You know, you tell that story when I got my first Beetle. You go through the story. Then I got a second one in 2001, it was a black one. Then I got my third one, it was green, but I painted it orange. And you tell the story. And what it does is it brings all that emotional flavor in. And they go, yes, I want a Beetle. You see how you build it up? Build a copy up. Keep it fascinating. Memorable. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah I, I remember when I first met Alan at the uh, Copywriters Masterclass. He told the story of his first Beetle. And it was in this old garage. It's all covered in blankets and all that. He got it cheap. You see, it's a memorable story. So keep your copy memorable as well. Test, uh, testimonials, is that spelled right? Testimonials? Testimonials, use testimonials. Use them sparingly or some adverts, some advertising. There's a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic direct response advert on uh, Sky TV at the moment. And it's for, um, it's, it's for a skin product, one of these buffing machines that take away, uh, you know, dead skin scales and all that stuff. The advert's 20 minutes long. It is an absolute killer. It's a killer. I actually recorded this advert. And the whole advert is testimonials. The whole advert. So you have it at the beginning, and she's using it. And then they have the woman who's selling it saying, yeah, well, we built this little thing, and it goes like that. And it goes through, and then it speaks to this young girl in a house. Yeah, well, I, honestly, I tried that side first. The wrinkles went. I've still got some hair still. But it's 20 minutes of testimonials. So if they're fascinating, not boring to death, you can fill it full of testimonials as well. So you can actually create copy just with testimonials. Easy. But in, a, in the same breath, I think testimonials these days are used so badly in copy. You see a lot of copy. The testimonials are just absolutely used wrongly. They could be so effective. That's where they do a bit of copy, stick a box in, do a bit of copy, stick a box in. It's just numb. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Good testimonial is get the results. So instead of saying, yeah, I went on that course, really good. Say, yeah, I went on that result, really good. And since then, I've increased my business by 83%. So that's a good testimonial. The bullet points, uh, I'm going to be a bit controversial here. Bullet points don't do it for me. But I know some people love bullet points. I think they're overused and I think they're highly exaggerated for selling. Because bullet points don't emotionally pull people in. But they're good for snapshot copy, they're good for trashy copy, they're good for quick fire copy. Uh, there's certain copywriters out there who are the king of bullets, they love bullets. You can read loads about bullets in all sorts of courses. Uh, but use them, use them sparingly. Don't do what some people are doing and write full sales letters with millions of bullet points. Don't do it. But just remember your bullet points. A bullet point has to be a headline, a mini headline. So remember, we're creating those big headlines. A bullet point should also be a headline as well. Because some people will actually just go through the bullets. But I like little snapshots of bullets rather than pages and pages of the stuff. And build the offer all the way through. All the way through, build the offer. Anticipation. So as you're going through, you're saying, at the beginning, you talk about the product and the results it's going to do. And as you're going through the whole thing, you say, yeah, but I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. And, you know, and we spent 10 years developing this product, and I'm going to show you exactly how we developed it in a second, just a couple of paragraphs down. And you're going through it, and you're building it, you're building anticipation, and then you make the offer. You build the offer. So all the way through the copy, you're building value, you're building value. If you use this, you'll increase your income. If you use this, you'll increase your business. If you use this, blah, blah, and keep building it, building it, building it, until you get to crescendo, and they say, yes, I want the product. So you've got to build the offer to make sure it's um, strong enough. So, again, short paragraphs are far more effective than uh, seven, eight, nine row paragraph. Keep it to three or four, three or four lines a paragraph. More effective. Staccato copy is more effective than rambling copy. I'm going to show you what that is in a minute. Staccato copy is the kind of copy where it kind of stops, but makes a point at every stop. Instead of going, and then we did, and then, and then it went on to. So I'm going to show you that in a quick second. Make your subheadings work. The subheadings are secondary to your headline. Your subheads have to feed the theme through. Remember the hairdressing advert, it fed the theme through. You could read the headline, and you could read the little bold subheadlines, and you could read that to get the gist of the advert. 
So make the subheads work in, t in, uh, in line with the, the main headline. Add facts. People love facts, actually. And this is where you get your snapshot copies very effective. If you get a little photograph, um, you know, you get a magazine like OK, and you open it up, and you maybe get a picture. Well, th this is not factual, but, you know, like, this is what people read in magazines. People will see a picture, and they read the copy underneath. So is it a strong headline underneath? Has Kimberly had surgery? Well, who cares about Kimberly? But what you would do is you would have your product there, and you would have a mini headline underneath to feed them in to the offer. So graphics and that work excellent in copy. Give them these little factuals all the way through. Did you know? Did you know that over 93% of people who take our uh, hypnosis, stop smoking thing, never smoke a cigarette again ever? That's a little what they call a factual. Build factuals in. Just dot them through. People will read through it. They want to know the facts. These are the sort of things that get read quick. Again, graphic enhancements. You're talking about this new Turbo Beetle. I wonder what that looks like. I wonder what the new Turbo Beetle looks like. Stick a picture of it in there. Did you just stick a picture of the Turbo Beetle in the, um, in the garage forecourt? No. You have somebody driving along in the car, don't you? So, you know, action graphics work better than still graphics as well, but it depends on the product, of course. How long should the copy be? Well, we covered that, really, as long as it takes to tell the whole story. That's how long the copy should be. Mike, see? <coughs> uh, my question and thought on how long the copy should be, presumably it ties into actually the, the price, the cost, or the price of the product. I mean, because people aren't, if you're paying $47 for product, you're not yeah. going to want to read a, a five-page sales letter, you, you know, yeah. the, the, the smaller the price that people are paying, the less they're going to want to sit down and read a whole long. Obviously, they're, they're paying £5,000 for, yeah. for something they're going to be willing, they'll, they'll want a lot more information before they make the decision. Yeah, well, that, that is a fact. Longer copy will, look at, longer copy is more effective for a high priced thing. I mean, if you look at the, the length of the copy on the Masterclass page, it was a pretty long page, really. And just out of interest, did everybody read the page? <laughs> you know yeah, to make a decision, yeah. Yeah. And did anyone else read it all? So, you know, long, long copy does get read, uh, generally as a rule, especially when it's a higher price thing. I also found with the My Squeeze page that just having the headline and one sort of subheadline underneath was enough to get people to sign up, and I got more people to sign up for yeah. that than putting even, you know, a half A4 worth of copy underneath yeah. but it's one, one headline and that's right. enough for them yeah and it's interesting you have to test this stuff I'm testing a page at the moment mm. where I thought I, I was actually t I, I actually copied an old car advert to be honest for a squeeze page I wanted to just try something different to see if it would work I'll show you after and basically half the page is a graphic and it's very old school advertising really really old school and it has a map of San Francisco in the middle then the heads of the speakers, and it do doesn't say the name, it just says, this is what I do, I do this. I thought, it looks a bit naff, but I'm going to try it for a squeeze page. But I also did another squeeze page where I had just mainly bullet points and headline. And the one with the graphic actually out pulling the one with the, the copy on, which actually surprised me, but I'll show you it later. Bit of a naff looking page, but it works. Converts about 24% actually, at the moment. Uh, Val, please. A squeeze page, all right, I'll show you, I'll, I'll rather tell you, I'll show you in a sec. Okay. Right. Yeah? Uh, apart from that, I was actually going to say exactly what was written there. You know, the more you tell, the more you sell is a very famous phrase from, I think, Claude Hopkins said it originally. Yeah. You know, and you've got to keep that in mind. The, the key to that is that you can, you can talk forever if you're saying stuff that interests the person. You know, a salesman who goes in to sell life insurance can sit there for two hours with the person. As long as he's saying stuff they want to hear, are they kicking him out of their house? No. So you just got to keep that in mind. It's got to be all those things that Alan just said, and you can go on for as long as you need to. And the, other, the, the only other thing I want to, want to say as a thought on that is that you've got to think of the process as a timeline of talking to the person. If I walked up to you and I said, for example, 
you know, you're a young guy, how would you like to meet beautiful women every day of the week? And you said yes. Then what am I going to say to him next? What, what would I then tell him? Would I tell him, okay, it's going to cost you $15,000 before I've given him anything else? No, I wouldn't. So think of it from the perspective of a timeline and each step you're leading them to the next step. And if you add that into telling more, you will get, you will get the, a concept of, of what it means to be able to go on for a longer length of time. Yeah. It's when you're not saying important stuff that they don't want to hear it. I, I, you know, yeah, yeah, that's right. I've yeah. written copy that has gone for 30 pages. And most people would look at that and they say, why would a person read that? I know they've read it yeah. because I've, I've tested stuff that I've got down the bottom that if they never got to that point, they wouldn't know about. Yeah. And they, they do. As a rule of thumb, long copy always up pulls short copy. It's a rule of thumb, really. But then again, you know, some people know exactly what they want. But, so this goes back to the customer, goes back to the mindset, goes back to the product. So some people don't want any copy. They just want to know how to buy it. Pat, please. Yeah. Suppose you get a client who wants you to write something for them and they only want it done in th two or three pages and you think it should be maybe a bit longer to tell it properly, what happens there? Well, if it's me, I, don't, I wouldn't work with a client. That's the first thing. But secondly, you will come into that situation where a client will try and dictate. The problem is if a client dictates, you'll kind of stuff the whole thing up, to be honest. Because clients haven't got a clue, they're not copywriters, they're not salesmen, they just don't know. So when they start dictating, I would always push them into what I would think works, or what I know works, rather than being dictated to by them. So that, that's the answer really, Pat. Right. If, if, a, if you get a load of trouble off a client, I mean, I generally just fire them, that's what I do. I've only fired about three, so it's not been that many. But look, if, if you know what you're doing, if you know exactly what you're doing, why, ha why have doubts because somebody who hasn't got a clue tells you? I mean, I did some copy for a guy recently, and he said, I've given everyone in the office uh, to read, and most of them don't like it, what should we do? And I said, just ignore them, put the copy up. He said, well, isn't that fatal? I said, what are they, copywriters and salesmen? Who's in charge here, me or you? So you've got to take control. You've got to take control because... We're going to go through all this tomorrow because clients will try and walk all over you. Yeah, that, uh, you'll probably discuss it tomorrow, but that's <coughs> the next point. It's, yeah. As a newbie, uh, you get a client and they say, I want this and you think it should be. We're going to cover it all tomorrow, all that. Right. Yeah. Right. What's the difference between these? Okay, anyone else? Okay. So, but, but, actually, you're both right, but what is the specific, there's a, a specific that's taking no, place? Easier to read. Easier to do with offering, well, but they're doing something and something back, back, back. Every full stop has a point. Right. Actually, James got it dead on, go on, Steve. I was just going to say the flow. The flow's different. Right, look at this. Look at the difference because it's actually the same paragraph, right? That's the difference. So, Bernadette's right. This is what we call staccato copy, which is you'll hear hilarious life stories and inspiring thoughts and actual real life techniques. You'll hear hilarious life stories inspiring thoughts, real life techniques, hundreds of ideas, tips, tricks, you must know on how to become. So you see the difference there, just using the word and. So just actually removing the word and and using the full stop increases the power of a paragraph. And that, that's actually a very powerful little tool you can learn. And like Bernadette just said, it's what we call staccato copy, which is boom, 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 boom rather than, because ah. you know, it's like you go, listen Ali, you got to go, it's brilliant, it's top, get one now. And that, because when you're enthusiastic and passionate about something, that's how you would tell them. So the principle is exactly the same there. Uh, Roger? Um, also, there's two key words there. The one you underline is should, and down at the bottom is must. Should is probably like maybe must is you absolutely have yeah, to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I missed that one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right, Roger just got that one there. So that one should and that one's must makes a difference. 
What's the difference on this one? What's the difference? <laughs> you went to America when you went drunk. <laughs> so let's have a look. Have you personalised it? Have you said how do I become a millionaire rather than how do you become a millionaire? Will you make it yeah. more relevant to the individual who's reading it? So what we've done on this, can't, oh no, let's go back. Hang on. So what we've done on this, you'll hear hilarious, we'll do this, you'll hear hilarious life stories. You'll hear hilarious life stories. Inspiring thoughts, wildly inspiring thoughts, real life techniques, actual real world techniques, hundreds of ideas, tips and tricks, plus over 129, you absolutely must know on this one subject, how do I, how do you, or how do, how to, how do I, how do I become a millionaire? You see, you see it's only wordplay this, it's only wordplay, but you see the difference it makes, it can make... The difference is pretty significant when somebody's reading it within sales copy, promotional copy. So overuse of the word and actually kills flow. So again, little tip, little tra technique. Now what I want to show you this, this is a page I was talking about. I'm a bit embarrassed to show you this because I'm not absolutely mad on it. But I'm going to show you anyway if I can. How does it work? Let's make sure we're online. Right, let's just get rid of that. <coughs> Sliding boxes increase um, sign-up rate rather than just a still opt-in box. That was a sliding box. Right, now this is for Millionaire Mind Events. This page, when we, when we launched this in test, it actually converted 100%. Now, I've never done 100% before. You're lucky if it does 2%. I'm going to explain why, exactly why in a minute. So... <coughs> Millionaire Mind Events, this is really targeted towards people who think, I want to be a millionaire, I'd love to make a million. So I tried something different on this I've not used before, which was taken from really old, old adverts. And that was just use a graphic at the top. So I used a graphic at the top, which was, whoa, one million. So I think, well, what's that about? So you've got the one million graphic. How would you like to discover? Now, if you use Learn... Some copywriters don't like Discover. I do. I think it works. Well, I know it works because I've tested it. But how would you like to learn how to? Does anybody want to learn anything, really? Because the association with learn is school. Hard work. How would you like to discover how you can see one million pounds in real, in your bank account? It's very possible. Here's how. Then it goes on. But what's good about this, this one? The one thing I do quite like about this is the... Um, then it says, it says, this might sound like a stupid question, but I want to ask it anyway. Would you like to be a millionaire? So how is the reader going to respond to that? Well, of course I would, yeah. Of course I would. Good, I'm glad you said, yeah, you did, right? Why did I ask you? Then it goes on. Have a look at this page later on. Then what it does in here, I, I, I actually decided to tell them what the page was about at the beginning so they can make a decision to read the rest if they want to. So basically, that first bit that tells you what the actual seminar is about. Then it goes down, it says, you know what it says here? It says, you'll also see on this page. Now, what does that mean? It means they're going to have to read the copy. So you're pushing through. It says, you'll also see on this page a list of speakers with their own premium credentials, blah, 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 blah. Then near the end of the page, you'll see our guarantee. I'm not telling them now. I'm going to push them through to read it. Then at the end, you'll find out how you can pay. By the way, the price is ridiculously low. You'll see that later as you read through. So you're pushing them through the copy. Now, what I do like about this, this little one, you see what starts there, it just says, OK. Let's just move this up a bit. <coughs> it says, OK. I've done the sales pitch at the beginning. OK, here we go. Here's a, here's a story just to put you right into the millionaire mindset right away. Read it. It's a little outrageous, but it's absolutely true. You see how we could do this over a table, just two of us talking? A conversational. Read it now. From dead broke, bankrupt, to millionaire, tax exile. Now listen, this is a true story, but I've been asked to change his name for reasons of privacy. You can understand that, can't you? So I've changed his name. 
At the age of 1985, sorry, 1985, blah, 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 then it goes through explaining how this guy became, got this 100 million pound in the bank when all these other mates have not done anything. So what happens is, people think, hang on, by the age of 40, crisis time at the age of 40. So you start thinking, I'm at 40, nearly 40, I'm over 40, whatever I am, and I've still got any money in the bank, I'm still struggling a little bit. But that guy did it. So you see what's happening on this? You're jumping right into the mindset of the individuals here that are reading it. Very targeted, and it goes on to say there that, that it says to earn over 100 million, that's before he hit 40. Look at that. That's 100 million. You see what's emphasized there? And now he's about to sell both his special edition Bentleys, his 100 acre farm, pack his bags, and move to France to become another UK tax exile, blah, blah, blah. And if you just go down a little bit further down, it just says there, that bit there, it just says, remember though, in other words, it could be you, remember though, Ben left school with no exam results, condemned by his teacher as a failure. Everyone can relate to that. And he <coughs> here's a bit about him and how he paved his path to a million. Keep reading. Just keep reading. It shows how anyone can make a million. And again, you go through. His first job tells you about his first job, dead end job, tells you about his second job. You see the snapshot copy there? You see that little snapshot? Ben paid for his first Bentley in cash. He was just 34 at the time. Wow, I want some of that. I want some of that. His second business was selling mountain bikes. Ben is worth over one, but look at the flow here. <clears throat> ben is worth blah, blah, blah. So the question is, you see how it flows? See, it's moving in. The question is, what's the difference between uh, with a millionaire mind and an average earning mind? Yes, there is a difference. Look at this again. Keep reading, and I'll explain more as the page carries on. What you're doing is you're behind them, you're pushing them through. You're pushing them through the copy, pushing them through all the time. And again, it goes into the guy's name who's actually writing this letter. Just take you through this. <clears throat> I'm the driving force, so he's given his credentials there. He tells them that this is a... Actually, that's wrong. It's the fifth event. I've put the third. Uh, the last two sold out. Again, it goes out, it's given proof what is a millionaire mind. What can you expect when you get there? Let's just move down because that's just all the speaker stuff. And what, what I like to do with speakers on um, web pages or copies, I like them to write their little bit. So you say, now in their own words, this is what, the, this is what they're going to be doing for you. So a little bit more personal. Let's just move down to this bit down here. Right. Couple of bullets now. So far, the lineup is looking pretty impressive. You agree? See, you're talking to them all the time. You agree? Right? Good? Good. Well, keep reading then. You see, you're pushing them through. Little trick there. Keep reading then, and I'll show you a tiny sample of things. Then you go to these bullets. Inspirational and motivational from average people just like you to catch it eventually. Blah, blah, blah. I can relate to that. The bullets are little headlines again. And again, I'll just take you through a little bit further. And these are nice little bullets as well. How an adopted twin from a dirt poor background, even classed as a retard at school, this guy, became a million uh, mind superstar in the USA through discovering how not to take no for an answer. And again, these little bullets again. Ex-hairdresser, nerdy school kid, bankrupt car dealer, blah, blah, blah. And you should know this, the guarantees in there. And again, <clears throat> just take you a little bit further down this one. It tells them where it is. There's a photograph of it. This looks good. This looks good. Again, look at this photograph. It's superior technology for your maximum experience. Uh, I pinched that off a friend of mine, that idea, actually. And they don't pay for the event. <clears throat> Remember, they don't pay for the event. It's just a tiny investment. So you're not buying a ticket, you're just making an investment. The longer you leave it, the price will go higher. It's what they call takeaway selling. Take it now, the price goes up. And straight down to the bottom. Oh, hang on, some must have reason, must have said reason one, two, three, four, five. Can you afford to, you know, so let me, so again, look, see how it's flowing. 
Can you afford to miss out on what is clearly going to be a life-transforming event for some? So let me ask you now, again, conversational flow, just flowing through there very, very nicely. And again, can you pinpoint your life-changing moment? And I can't quite remember, I think that that bit there takes them more into like futuristic dream copy, it takes them forward. Is this you? Remember the bit at the end of the copywriter's masterclass where that does the same, goes forward. Imagine this now. Imagine exactly 12 months after this class and you're driving your new car along the street. You check the bank this morning. There's 43 grand in the bank that you can spend today if you want. So you're taking them forward. You're showing them the result and the consequence of not taking action. There's a picture of George. Yes, 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 George. Blah, 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 blah. So on. So you can see, you can see how using that kind of copy just pulls them through. Just pulls them through really, really nicely. And again, you, you know, the one thing I want you to remember is the conversational aspect of this. Um, which, which one is it? Let's go back. Is it that one? That's it. So again, let's just jump into office quick. I don't want to spend ages on this. Oh, hang on, have I done that? There's, there's another one underneath. Let's just show you the one underneath first, which again is very similar. Now, let me just show you that one quickly. Uh, I've lost it now. Let me just show you that. Right, okay. Well, the first one underneath, I'll just tell you because it's similar to what we did earlier. It's just a dull advert lifted. And again, you know, you've got the headline, but the first, the first offer just says, you know, 1.6 Beetle, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sorry, if you click the page up, you'll probably get the slide above it. Page up? Yeah, on here, on well, the keyboard. <coughs> you click the page up, sorry. No. No, it's the, it's the one underneath. No. So just make your offer mouth watering. You build the offer through the copy. But look what's happening here. Here's how. Order this week and we'll give you. We'll give you. So the one underneath basically says, um, you know, 1.6, leather interior, whatever. But this one's dressing the same thing up. No percent finance, free insurance, choice of 11 colours, choice of 11 leathers, choice from six alloys, funky iPod player, fully electric, and we're going to give away a long week in France so you can take a new vehicle for a mega drive into the sunshine. Order this week and we'll deliver in seven days, guaranteed. Just 11 available. So what you do with an offer, <coughs> the key to a good offer, right, is take the offer to the very, very edge. Give them every single thing you can until it absolutely hurts. So you take your offer all the way to the edge all the time. Because remember, again, it depends on the price and the value of the product, but you look at the lifetime value of a customer here. What is the lifetime value of getting somebody in the system once? So if they buy something off you for, say, 100 quid, and you know that your averages, your customers, are going to stay with you for three and a half years, and they spend 100 quid every two months, well, you see how much they're going to be worth over that couple of years. So really, on your initial offer to get them in, you should be looking at break even, or even actually costing you something. It depends on your lead generation product. But take your offer right to the edge, as far as you can go. All right. And again, takeaway, just 11 available, order seven days, blah, 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 the usual stuff. Again, how to make boring exciting, well, kind of. There's no such thing as a boring product. New, if you hate ironing, you'll love Morphe Richard's new crease killer. So you've taken away the emphasis from being something to just do the ironing with, to something new, to people who hate ironing, everybody does. Well, you will love, so it's emotional, and here's the pain, it gets rid of the creases. I used to hate ironing, not anymore, now it's fast, now it's easy, staccato copy. Now it takes just half the time it used to, and getting rid of, rid of stubborn stains, you get the point. Stubborn creases. I think there's another one. Announcing the fastest, lightest, most accurate ping-pong ball ever created by champion. I mean, it's only a ping pong ball. I'm just trying to illustrate the fact that you can make really numb, dumb things sound quite good. Because what you're doing here is it's targeted, 
It's for champions. It's light. It's accurate. Is there another? Yeah, I think there is. I love them. New Funky Habitat tea mugs made me the talk of all my friends. I mean, goodness me, it's only a cup. But, you know, you've got to, if you're writing for somebody or you're writing for somebody, you've got to sell these products. It's a cup, a cup, nothing else. So let's recap, because we're going to finish for dinner now for an hour. 80% of the readers never read the headline. So you need to spend 80% of your copy time preparing, putting together, researching everything you need for the headline. Look for hot trigger words to move them or pull them in. Can anybody remember what we're talking about with the hot trigger words? What, what was I saying? Let's have some feedback. Must, will, time. Action. Wave. Yeah. Green. Green. Or free. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay, let's just move on. Think about the buyer's mind and how they think. It's, honestly. It's so essential. I mean, I, I've read loads of copy stuff, and nothing ever talks about the mind of the buyers. You've got to think about the buyer. It's crucial. What's the buyer thinking? You know, I mean, if you're a modern mother, or you're going to have a baby, you're going to spend time looking for the pram or the buggy. Because you know you need to get in and out on the beach, down the hills, up the hills, up the drive. So how are you going to switch that person on to buying that particular pram? I mean, there's a million prams out there, millions of prams. So what's it going to take to make that lady go and buy that buggy? You've got to just, just think about these little things. You know, this, that three-wheeled buggy, you, we all saw them, didn't we, when they first came out with the big wheels? I mean, they were brilliant, weren't they? Because they were originally designed so people could actually still do jogging, pushing the buggy. So there's a, quite a bit of thought went into that. But everybody else bought them because, yeah, because they look really cool. And they do look nice. So just think about the buyers and what they're thinking. Emotion, you, free. You need to capture the attention fast. <clears throat> Online, you have seconds, three, four, five seconds. If you don't capture their attention in that time, you are stuffed. They'll, they'll move on. Let's just cover that a little bit more online just for a sec. Just remember... Um, <clears throat> I think what I'll do is I'm going to send everybody a DVD of a talk I did just on web copy. I'll, send you, I'll make sure I'll send you all a copy of that. Now, what you need to do with this is, when they're online, just remember, somebody is sat there typing in a specific. So people don't type in um, new mini. Right? They type in red secondhand Mini Cooper. And they may put the plus sign at the end of Google, the search, and they may put Manchester area. And then it brings up the search. So when somebody lands on your web page, does it say, are you looking for mint condition, red, Mini Cooper, 2,000 miles only? So in other words, your web copy is always feeding the search, always feed the search. And this is why you should have separate pages to feed this as well especially using their Google AdWords campaigns and that kind of stuff. I forgot to show you the squeeze page. I'll do that in a sec. So web copy is slightly different. It's more reactive. It's more disbelieved. You know, so you've got to change it slightly, but make sure the web copy always feeds the search. So this is where you need to know where your stats, where your websites. If you have a decent stats package, it will tell you the keywords and the key phrases that people are typing into Google, Yahoo, or whatever. Make sure you have a, t a page designed specifically around that phrase. Otherwise, you'll lose the sale. What can you learn from Charles Atlas? I mean, you could rewrite, rerun, rehash those ads a thousand million times over. Easily. They're just classic adverts. Classic. And actually, I've never seen a copywriter talk about those ads. So, you know, if you start using them, people after the DVD may start using them. But if you start using them, you're going to have a little bit of edge if you keep it targeted. He never sold fitness, remember, he sold the man in the leopard skin underpants. <laughs> but he sold the body, didn't he? Would you like a body like this? It wasn't steroid and fat free, you can see it was a 1920s muscle man. But that's how guys wanted to look then. And just, you know, the body copy, remember the body copy, treat buyers with respect, they're not idiots, don't try and fool people with copy. People aren't stupid, especially with the advent of the web, they are not stupid, and they can see through everything. So... Get into character, remember character, B 
be specific, avoid generalities, keep interesting. Remember when the old guy came out, he was 84 with his stick, and we lifted the carriage door together, we pulled off the blankets after seeing the blanket shapes in the shape of a beetle. You know, be specific, tell the story. Keep it interesting, fascinating. Pull them through the copy. Remember, and kills flow and impact. Remember, we said that short little bit about staccato copy. Bang, bang, bang. Bang, bang. Just tell them short. So, some markets actually are no good for staccato copy. Some markets are just no good for it. So again, you have to know what your marketplace is and your targets as well on that one. Off the top of my head, Bernadette, I can't. Uh, can you think of any, Raj and Steve? There's, there's, some, there's some markets maybe like um, maybe like the legal profession, I suppose, and which they just dealing with clients like just a nightmare to write for. Yeah, I think more formal areas. More, more formal. Yeah. So, st yeah, staccato copy is good for sales. Because it gets to the point. But what you have to remember about that kind of copy is you have to use it liberally as well. I would certainly wouldn't use it in every paragraph. You know, if you really want to hammer home a point, use it in that paragraph. But then the rest of it, you know, still use the word and and still pull them through and make it flow. But I wouldn't do every single paragraph because it can read a bit like that. It's only when you want to hammer a point home, really. But it's very powerful. I mean, just all my copy uses that. <coughs> oh, yeah. um, just, just, a, just a point. Um, it sounds the uh, staccato copy does sound effective, but it also sounds very masculine. It sounds like when a, a woman and a man are having a conversation, the man's like, "Get on with it, tell me the point, tell <laughs> me the point." Whereas a woman's still yeah. working out all the. So I wondered, you know, do, do you think it appeals to more men than women? I know that when women are busy, they want the man to get to the point as well when they're waffling yeah. on, <laughs> but. Yeah. I do know that women, women what, and men what, talk about Why did everybody laugh then? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Explain. I want specific. to do with the blankets and the old. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, <coughs> I just wondered whether that came in. I don't know really, to be honest. It's, it's possible. You have to write to market, of course. You have to know what the market is and what the marketplace wants. And I know what you're saying, <coughs> but I mean, I've written for uh, women's markets as well. Which, to be, to be honest with you, this is the truth, right? I think women can write for women. That's what I think. I think women can write for men, but I don't think men can write for women. That, that, and that's how I feel about that. I, d I did a big project for um, a company that just specialises in women's natural health. And in the end, I just... Uh, I didn't fire them, we just agreed to part. Because I just couldn't get into the, the women's mindset on that, to be honest. So I think it is a bit of... I'm not, I'm not a politically correct animal, so don't give me any hype and juice and all that stuff. You know. So it does work like that. Copy does work like that. I'm sure it does. Does anyone disagree? The only other thing I was going to say was it depends how the rest of your letter is put together too. If yeah. the rest of your letter is very gentle and <coughs> feminine, when you get to that point, even though you're being very short and direct, it won't come across like Alan comes across when he's short and direct. Mm. You know, when you see it in his... If it's, it's just congruency, I guess, is what I'm, what I'm and saying. And it's personality driven as well, remember. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're a kind of a soft-spoken, mild personality, it generally would come through in a copy. But if you're a bit kind of eccentric or, what, you know, different ways, it'll come through in the wor wording as well. So you've got to just tailor it towards yourself, characteristics, the market, everything else. But I don't think men can write for women. That's a fact. So what would you learn from that Millionaire Mind event page? It's worth going to that website. In fact, when you go to it, the first page, if you go straight to that website, it takes you to the squeeze page. The squeeze page is basically the first web page with a short piece of kind of headline copy. And the only way they can read the rest of the page is if they put a name and an email in. That's a squeeze page. So you're squeezing details from them. And then they push through to the main sales page then. That's what a squeeze page is. <coughs> and direct conversation will take you to the limit. So, we're going to finish for dinner. Uh, after the break, you're going to hear Raja, who's going to cover some really good stuff for you. And again, you, you'll notice today, <coughs> we're brushing over some stuff. There's some stuff you just can't cover. You just go away and read about it in other books. F for me, it's not crucial because for me, it's all that conversation. 
Uh, you read about bullet points and all that stuff if you want to know more about all that stuff. Uh, Roger is going to cover a little bit more about headlines, slightly different twist. So he's going to be taking you through his twist on headlines and how it works for him. And it's nice to see the different viewpoints on the same subject and how you can make those applications to yourself as well. And also Roger is going to take you through some bonus material and then we're going to, uh, we're going to have another break then. Uh, what time do we come back after dinner? Is it quarter to... Two fifteen. So if we can come back for two fifteen, and uh, we'll see you all then. Thanks. Great. All right. Thank you.